In the headlines, a senior diplomats from South Korea, China, and Japan vow to restore stagnant trilateral cooperation as they prepare for a foreign minister's meeting set for later this month. Hyundai Motor is reportedly pushing for a second plant in the United States to meet rising demand there. Four years after the Fukushima nuclear crisis, the cleanup efforts continue, but concerns over radiation levels also remain. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. We begin with latest efforts at East Asian diplomacy. Senior diplomats from South Korea, China and Japan met in Seoul on Wednesday to lay the groundwork for a trilateral foreign ministers meeting slated for later this month. And it will be the first meeting of the top diplomats in three years. And some are hopeful that a trilateral summit could be around the corner. Hwang sung reports. Tangled in historical and territorial disputes, senior officials from Korea, China and Japan met in Seoul on Wednesday in an effort to revive cooperation. Their second meeting in six months has added importance since it comes ahead of the first trilateral foreign ministers meeting since 2012. We have come to agree to host the foreign ministers meeting this month and convened here under the clear purpose of preparing for the meeting. Korea, as the current rotating chair, has been pushing for a gathering of the top diplomats since late last year. The three-way talks had been stalled mainly due to the territorial row between Japan and China over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, known in China as Diaoyu. Despite the challenges, Japanese Deputy Foreign Minister Shinsuke Sugiyama expressed hope for the ministerial meeting to lead to a summit. In a better position to prepare for uh, the upcoming uh, uh, foreign ministerial trilateral uh, to be held sometime uh, uh, later uh, half of uh, this month uh, and hopefully to be uh, followed up further uh, by the highest level. Uh, uh, of us three. Taking a more cautious stance, the Chinese chief delegate refrained from mentioning such possibility but acknowledged the importance of the upcoming meeting. And this progress has not come easily and should be cherished. But there is little hope that the ministerial meeting will actually break the ice between the three neighbors. An official at Seoul's foreign ministry said the top diplomats will strictly be discussing their trilateral cooperation, leaving out the more sensitive historical and territorial issues. Hwang sang Arirang News. A senior U.S. military officer says more multilateral dialogue is key in keeping an unpredictable North Korea in check and preventing any miscalculations. The remarks follow military talks between the United States and China, where Beijing officials are usually reluctant to talk about North Korea issues. Kim Hyun-bin reports. The U.S. Army Pacific Commander General Vincent Brooks says North Korea came up in his discussions with Chinese military leaders during his recent visit to China. In an interview with the Brookings Institution's Order from Chaos blog on Tuesday, Brooks said he visited Beijing and Hainan last month and had meetings with China's top generals. But he did not elaborate on what the two sides said about North Korea. However, he did emphasize the need for dialogue between the U.S., China, South Korea and Japan to formulate a coordinated policy to counter the North Korean nuclear and missile threat. Brooks said the regime's continual provocations and lack of transparency means there's always the potential for a military miscalculation. He added that, given North Korea's unpredictable nature, the Pacific Command remains on a so-called fight-tonight posture and stressed that U.S. troops in South Korea are always on alert. In regards to the U.S. general's meeting in China, Diplomatic sources in Washington say it's unlikely much progress was made on North Korean issues. They note that, in previous encounters, China has been reluctant to talk to the U.S. about North Korea, especially in regards to the North's leadership 
and internal changes inside the isolated regime. Come on, Ben. IDEA News. Korea's presidential office has reiterated its position that no decision can be made about the deployment of a U.S. missile defense system to South Korea simply because there has been no request from Washington. Experts say the presidential office will likely keep this stance because talking about it publicly could affect Korea's relations with the U.S. and China. Beijing has raised concerns about the possible deployment, saying it's a threat to its national security. This follows recent reports that Washington Washington is mulling over sending the missile defense system called THAAD to South Korea in order to counter ballistic missile threats from the north. Following an appalling attack on the U.S. ambassador to Korea, Mark Lippert, last week, several countries have requested the Korean police to extend protection for their diplomatic delegations. Korean National Police Agency Chief Kang Shin Myung made the announcement at Wednesday's government ruling party meeting and added that extra security and protection for diplomatic delegations in Korea will be provided. Security guards will be deployed even without prior requests if circumstances are deemed dangerous. Kang added that officers started providing 24 hour security to the U.S. ambassador and his wife immediately after the attack and also sent security guards to protect the Japanese ambassador to Korea. Hyundai Motor is reportedly planning to build a new second factory in the United States to meet the demand for SUVs. The company has not confirmed it, but industry sources say this plant could have the capacity to produce up to 300,000 SUVs a year. Kim Minji has the details. Hyundai Motor will reportedly build a new production plant in the United States as cheap gas prices, coupled with the economic recovery, is driving demand for SUVs in the U.S. market. Total SUV sales in the U.S. spiked 15 percent in the first two months of the year compared to the same period a year ago. Hyundai's popular Santa Fe model saw a 20 percent hike in sales to over 16,000 units during the same period. Industry sources tell Korea-based Yonhap News Agency that Hyundai has finalized plans to build a new plant solely dedicated to its SUV lineup this year, with an eye on starting production in 2017. Hyundai currently has just one plant in the U.S. that only produces sedans. The sources say the plant located near Hyundai's current Alabama plant will have an annual capacity of 300,000 units. With two more plants planned in China and another currently under construction in Mexico, all with the same capacity, Hyundai and Kia Motors' combined total production output should top 9 million units by 2018, with overseas production accounting for 60 percent from the current 55 percent. Hyundai, however, has declined to officially confirm the report, saying nothing has been decided yet. Such a move could be seen as going against the Korean government's push to beef up facilities investment at home to boost domestic sentiment and job growth. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. There's a place called the Culture and Creativity Fusion Center in Seoul that recently opened its doors. Anyone can go to the center and use the equipment there free of charge to produce new content. Our Chi Myung-gil has more. In this studio, dancers' graceful movements are recorded by a computer using motion capture technology. With the digital 3D models that are created, people can study the choreography or create something new. Here, anyone who has the skills to shoot and edit films can come and make their own movies. At the new cultural center, people can do anything from produce records or a broadcast to make a film or performance. There's even one-on-one -on -one mentoring for anyone who's interested in creative work but needs a little advice. And the best part is that all of the facilities are available for free. The government and entertainment companies are giving opportunities to people who are willing to do business in the cultural realm by providing them with such facilities. The government is trying to help people who don't know how to start a cultural business by providing funding and consulting programs. 
This culture center is part of the government's efforts to transform small ideas and the products of a creative imagination into commercial mass media products. The best creations will be sent to venture companies for production. I hope the culture center will help Korea's cultural content industry to create a fusion of new ideas and a culture industry as we are lagging behind globally. To broaden the platform for the development of new cultural content, the government plans to open a culture and creativity academy by the end of 2016 for research and development programs and to foster new talent. By the end of 2017, the so-called K-Culture Valley will open with a multifunctional performance hall, a pop music-themed amusement park, and a Hallyu street where tourists can enjoy elements of Korean mass media and pop culture. Kim young Arirang News. Korea's zeal for education is known around the world, but that exuberance has put a tremendous amount of pressure on its children. Ironically, many of these kids say they feel healthy, but experts worry about long-term consequences. Connie Kim has the details of the study. Korea is well known for its high education fever, but its school children feel highly pressured to succeed in the academic world. A report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs measuring Korean children's academic stress shows more than 50 percent of children in a 2013 survey scored a three or higher out of four on the academic stress index higher than the global average. The index accounts for elements such as children's preschool enrollment and academic achievements. While stress typically takes a toll on a person's health, the report says this isn't the case for Korean children. When asked about their health, an overwhelming 97 percent of the children surveyed said they believe they're in good or average physical health. The research conductor says these seemingly contradictory results reflect the unique Korean characteristic of enduring hardship and the high priority on education. In Korea, admission to a prestigious university is considered an important milestone. I believe this widespread perception partly shapes students' ability to endure stress and feel physically fine. Psychologists, however, worry that children do not feel the need to relieve stress. That, if left unchecked, could lead to various side effects, such as violent behavior or addiction. There are generally two ways of relieving stress, calming yourself down or letting it out. For children, it's important that parents acknowledge their stress levels and help them let it out. Writing in a journal or taking the time to enjoy a hobby are recommended outlets. But psychologists say these are just a band-aid on the problem. What's more important, they say, is for Korean society to reflect on its values. Whether that's loading kids with homework for academic success or raising kids that are both physically and mentally healthy. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Exactly four years ago, Japan was hit by a massive earthquake and tsunami that claimed thousands of lives and released deadly radiation from three destroyed reactors at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Cleanup efforts continued, but residents still worry about their health and safety. Son jung in reports on the lingering contamination problem. Life is gradually returning to normal in the disaster-stricken Fukushima region as workers continue their efforts to clean up the area and lower radiation levels. Kawauchi, located within 20 kilometers of the Fukushima power plant, is one of the villages that has had its evacuation advisory lifted since the meltdown disaster four years ago, but only seven of its 274 former residents have decided to return. It's hard to say whether the town will ever be the same. I've told my son to return to the village with his family, but I can't force them as it is ultimately their decision. Over 117-thousand former residents from Fukushima are reluctant to return home due to fears of high radiation levels. And the potential long-term implications, including cancer, are causing more concern. The number of children diagnosed with thyroid cancer is increasing in Japan, with more than 100 confirmed or suspected cases after tests of nearly 400,000 children. Before the disaster, there were just one to two cases of thyroid cancer in a million among Japanese children. 
Another concern is the treatment of farmland that remains contaminated with higher than natural levels of radiocesium in some regions. With no distinct plans to address the problem, efforts to decontaminate the soil are generating a massive amount of radioactive waste, which is packed into black bags and moved to temporary sites. Some Japanese people still remain doubtful about what the government is telling them about radiation levels and safety, saying the government has failed to protect them. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. Following marathon talks in Brussels, EU finance ministers have given the green light to injecting uh, over 340 billion U.S. dollars into the eurozone economy. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, what are the details of this major investment plan? Well, it's a four-year plan outlined by the European Commission, and it calls for the backing of somewhat riskier projects from airports to railways. Now, EU officials say this move is in response to the sharp drop in investment following the 2008 financial crisis, which continues to hinder the European economy as it pushes towards recovery. Our Shin Zemin has more. The European Union has decided to set up a four-year, 340 billion U.S. dollar investment plan in order to help revive its struggling economy. The agreement on the so-called European Fund for Strategic Investment was made during an EU finance minister's meeting in Brussels on Tuesday. The investment plan is the answer we need to confront the main handicap of the European economy, a lack of investment. The decision still needs the approval of the European Parliament. If approved, EU officials say the stimulus plan could be up and running by the end of June or July. Under the plan, a guaranteed fund of $22 billion will be set up, with the hope of attracting some $340 billion through private investment by 2017. Italy announced that it would inject $8.5 billion into the fund, after Germany and France said they would contribute the same amount. Spain also vowed to chip in $1.6 billion. But none of the other EU countries have committed to investing in the fund. The ministers also agreed on other matters. France was given a two extra years to bring its deficit below the 3 percent threshold, the third time the country has been granted an extension. Paris now has more time to implement reforms and cut spending amid feeble economic growth and low inflation. France has been exceeding the EU's deficit target of 3 percent of GDP for six straight years. Greece's economic woes also came up. Germany's finance minister said Athens will receive no more aid until the country's international creditors are satisfied that it has delivered on its reform commitments. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And shifting to the U.S., former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton addressed head-on the growing controversy surrounding her use of private emails while in office. Republican members of Congress have been her hardest critics who claimed the move was an attempt to cover up important facts from the public about her work. In an attempt to defuse the situation, Clinton held a press conference at the United Nations in New York on Tuesday. There she said she regretted her choice in correspondence, but stressed she didn't violate any rules. She also insisted that no classified materials were ever sent via her personal emails. The controversy comes ahead of Hillary Clinton's expected bid for the Democratic presidential nomination for the 2016 election. And in other news, U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is set to depart for Japan to attend an international symposium in Tokyo next Monday. The event will be hosted by Japan and the United Nations University to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the founding of the world body. All eyes are on whether the U.N. chief will call on Tokyo to sincerely address its wartime history as he speaks alongside Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Ahead of the symposium, Ban is also scheduled to attend the third U.N. World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which opens this Saturday in Sendai. This will be Ban's fourth official trip to Japan after three consecutive annual visits from 2009. And finally, British artist Sarah Brightman is hoping to become the first professional singer to perform in Zero Gravity. Speaking in London on Tuesday, the famed soprano said she expects to blast off into space in September via the Russian Soyuz rocket for a 10-day stay aboard the International Space Station. I have mentioned that I would like to um, 
you know, sing something from space. You know, a, an engineer or somebody in sciences or biologists will go up and do what they can yeah. and, and, and their experiments. Their experiments. But uh, with me, really, all I can do is do what I do, and that's sing. Um, so we're trying to work this out at the moment. We're, we're working on, on the music for it. As she does go through with the mission, the 54-year-old singer will become the eighth space tourist to the ISS. Bryman also said she was funding the space trip by herself at an estimated cost of 35 million U.S. dollars. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Che with the Sports Brief. Now the buzz is in the air as Park Joo Young makes his return to FC Seoul and the K League. His pro career has looped back to where it all began 10 years ago. FC Seoul welcomed back their prodigal son who will don the red and black shirt as number 91. Why 91? 9 plus 1 equals 10, which is his former number and one that's traditionally reserved for the top striker of a team. Pak joined the squad in training Wednesday and will get to work to get into playing form, but he won't be in a match until at least next month as the team wraps up the necessary paperwork. Let's go to the KBL playoffs for Game 2 between the SK Knights and the ET Land Elephants. The home team, despite missing star Aaron Haynes to injury, shot to the lead early. But ET Land sees the game late in the final quarter, thanks to Ricardo Powell's efforts in the closing seconds. Now ET Land heads home with a 2-0 lead, with a chance to end the series in Game 3. Over to pro volleyball, the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers hosted the LIG Graders in Chonan. The Graders shot to the 2-0 lead, threatening a sweep, but the Skywalkers put it together, taking the next three sets. The momentum was behind LIG as they picked up the five-set victory. Moving on, Lee Seung Yup has put together a successful career, has raised a family, and holds the home run record. Now he can add being in a textbook to the list. The Lion King is featured in a two-page interview in a middle school textbook covering careers and vocations. In the memorable tidbit, he recommends that students not be obsessed only with their studies, but also find time to exercise. The 38-year-old said he was honored to take part and that it motivated him to play better baseball. Finally, Real Madrid progressed to the Champions League quarterfinals, but their embarrassing 4-3 loss to Schalke left fans angry and their star player speechless. Cristiano Ronaldo was left fuming after the match, telling reporters he wouldn't speak to the media until the end of the season. Although Real advances on aggregates, the loss is the second in a row. Their previous loss dropped them out of first place in the league. Perhaps the prolific striker will have something to say when his team starts winning again. Well, that's all I have for now. Your weather's up next. Good night. Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with the weather outlook. It seems like the cold has taken a step back compared to yesterday, but conditions remain colder than the seasonal average. And today's mostly clear skies will make way for snow showers that are in store for tomorrow. About a centimeter is expected for Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, and Jeollabuk-do provinces, and about five millimeters of precipitation should fall in those areas. Also, air quality continues to be very dry in most parts of the country, including the capital where humidity levels are down at 28 percent. Also, a cold snap is set to continue through tomorrow morning, but relief is in sight as things will get back to seasonal averages by the afternoon, so be aware of the big gap in temperatures between the day and night. On to the readings. Seoul reaches a high of 7, Taegwin, Gwangju 13, Busan 11. Meanwhile, Jeju hits 12, Tokdo 5, Mount Kumgang minus 5. That's all I have for you now, but more updates coming up in just about two hours. See you then.
And that's primetime news at this hour. Thanks for watching. I'm Kung Titi. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great night. We'll see you soon.